It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. James Lang to our event. Dr. Lang is Professor of Practice at the Canav, Canav I think I'm, I didn't get it right, the Canav Center for Teaching Excellence at the University of Notre Dame, and Emeritus Professor of English at Assumption University in Worcester, Mass. Uh, he is the author of six books, the most recent of which are, I'm going to read, Distracted, Why Students Can't Focus and What You Can Do About It, Small Teaching, Everyday Lessons from the Science, excuse me, the science of learning and cheating lessons, learning from academic dishonesty. A sought after speaker, he has given talks and workshops on teaching for faculty at more than 300 colleges, universities, and schools across the US and abroad, focused on topics such as the science of learning, distraction in the classroom, academic integrity, and yes, navigating AI and ChatGPT. Dr. Lang has consulted for the UN on the development of teaching materials in ethics and integrity for college faculty, and is the recipient of a 2016 Fulbright Specialist Grant to work with three universities in Columbia on the creation of a MOOC on teaching and learning in STEM education. He has a BA in English and Philosophy from the University of Notre Dame, an MA in English from St. Louis University, and a PhD in English from Northwestern University. And please join me in the chat in welcoming Dr. Lang. All right, thank you, Nancy. Uh, and to everyone else who helped me, uh, helped uh, this event um, come together and in inviting me. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today. I'm going to talk for a little while and then hopefully have a little time for a question and, and discussion as well. So by all means, uh, put your questions and comments in the chat as we go forward. And I'm sure we'll have some time to discuss those. Um, so my goal really here today is to kind of um, dig into some principles. Um, and I'm sort of, you know, I, you're after I leave, you're going to have opportunities to sort of um, think about more practical ways of using AI in the classroom and, and some of the ways that maybe your colleagues are uh, innovative ways your colleagues are doing that work. Um, but my goal really is to step back a little bit and to think about why. What are we doing with AI? Um, how does it have an impact on things like academic integrity? Even more importantly, um, student learning. And what is really the role that AI is playing uh, you know, and will play in the future in terms of the kind of deepest questions that we want to ask about the purpose of education and how we promote promote and support learning in the classroom. So that's really the goal here. So um, I'm going to spend a little time uh, just sort of, you know, some raising some questions here. Um, then I'm going to introduce some principles, three principles that I think can guide our work with AI. And after each of those principles, I'll kind of give some ideas about how I think um, we could move forward in a positive direction. Um, and I hope that that'll kind of set the tone for um, the work that you'll be able to sort of engage with um, later in the day. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, and then I guess maybe one other thing to say here is that, you know, um, you have a nice code there for, for cheating lessons. Cheating lessons, you know, has written, was written long before AI. Um, it's the principles that, oh, that, and you'll see if you look at the book, um, it does, address academic integrity, but what it does is try to take, um, when we look at why people cheat, how can we how can we get better as teachers and how as learners, when we try to understand why do people engage in acts of um, academic dishonesty? So really it's a teaching and learning book, but it just sort of starts in that place. And that's the same thing I'm gonna do here today. Um, I'm gonna think a little bit about the sort of principles that help us that might, um, you know, it might address che uh, cheating and academic integrity, but really we're trying to get to the deeper stuff about teaching and learning, the purpose of education, and how do we support our students. So that's really kind of, I'm gonna take that same kind of approach to uh, AI that I did in cheating lessons as well. Um, but just be aware that you're not gonna find um, things about AI in cheating lessons because the book was written a few years ago. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen here and we'll start the um, start our conversation. So um, you'll get a sense of how, um, you know, my sort of approach is a sort of more philosophical, principle-based approach here, because I'm going to start with a, a, a quote or a, um, an idea from a thinker for, you know, a, a century, from a, a century ago. I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the work of John Dewey. Um, and I'm especially going to draw from a, a very short book that he wrote at the end of his life. John Dewey was, of course, the American philosopher and educational theorist who, um, uh, did I, am I, let me make sure I want to share my screen here. 
who um, whose work is very um, you know sort of everywhere in the American education system. Um, you know, we can sort of draw a lot of stuff that we think about in terms about active learning, experiential learning. Um, a lot of that work comes from John Dewey's theories and philosophies. And so John Dewey, um, you know, sort of really pioneered a lot of these ideas about how to use experience and and having uh, students and children be very active in the classroom. Um, but at the end of his life, he gave a series of lectures, and it was in this 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 very short little book. Uh, it's it's almost it's like a hundred pages long. So I really recommend it. I'll show you a quote from it in just a minute. And in this book, he kind of said, "Okay, hold, let's let's step back here and think about what we're doing." in the ways that we sort of design courses and, and engage in classroom activities, what is the real purpose of doing that? What does it really mean for a student to be educated and to learn in a, in a formal, um, like a classroom atmosphere? And this is what the John Dewey argued. Um, our real goal here is promote growth. So positive educational experiences fuel growth in students. And that growth, you know, we can divide that uh, define that in different ways, but you know we're, we're expanding our brains, we're expanding the opportunities that we have, um, we're laying down pathways for future growth, so we can continue to expand as people, and so you know we can be, grow grow in our virtues, our, our our knowledge, our skills, our opportunities, all these things. So the the real goal of what we're trying trying to do with students to help them to sort of experience growth, and so the things that we want to do in the classroom are designed to support that kind of growth. But there's so that was kind of the, the core idea that, that um, Dewey kind of um, lays out in this little book, Experience in Education. It's very readable, by the way, because it was initially de uh, delivered as lectures. Um, anyways, so Dewey kind of makes a distinction here, though. So there's we can sort of do things in the classroom that would promote growth in the moment. So he calls that sort of present present growth. There's also so things that we can do which would promote growth in the future. And those things are not always the same. A learning activity might promote growth in the present. In other words, it helps me do this task in the classroom right now. But there are other kinds of activities that might promote growth, growth in the future. It will help me, it'll lay down pathways for me to develop new skills in the future. Give me knowledge that will help me in my future learning experiences, right? So, and translate those experiences in a new context. You know, one of the things that we want to be able to have to do with our learning is to move them into a different context. Now, Dewey says that actually these things are not always the same. The things that we might do in the moment might actually shut off pathways for future growth. This is a really um, interesting, important distinction here, because I think it's one that is really one that has come, come to the fore right now in terms of our dis discussions about AI. So here's what he says. Um, some present-oriented experiences can stop or limit growth by robbing students of skill or knowledge that would further their growth. They could limit the potential of their thought, the creative potential of their thought. In other words, those experiences, and he, he calls them miseducative, miseducative experiences. So some kinds of experiences we might have that we might sort of use with students, they're good in the moment, they're interesting, they might help me accomplish a task, they're actually shutting off future growth for me. And this is the kind of uh, a key quote here. Every experience that a student has in the classroom is going to live on in their further experiences. Okay, so every experience that we have is going to live on in my future experiences. Now, okay, so that's the kind of big picture sort of philosophical um, grounding for what I'm going to sort of present to you today. We want to think about this. What is the role that AI is playing here in terms of both present growth and in future growth. So that's that's the question that we're going to take up, right? So how can we, both teachers and learners, engage with Gen AI, Gen AI, in which promote both these kinds of growth, and even you know more importantly too, how do we, how do we avoid miseducation with Gen AI? How do we make sure that we're, students are not using it in ways that will sort of may, might help them in the moment? but are robbing them of skills that will then they won't have access to in the future that might be helpful for them. Okay, so that's the kind of the philosophical grounding here. So I'm gonna make a case for, for three kind of principles that can be used to help us think through the ways that we use Gen AI. And you're gonna see, I'm not someone who's gonna say, 
you know, we should be using it all the time or that we should never be using it. Because <laughs> I think, you know, we, it's a, you'll see, I'm going to make the case that's sort of more contextual than that. It depends on the goals that we're having, the, the goals that we have for our learners, for our courses, for our sort of, you know, our, our larger goals of society and, and humans, all that kind of stuff. So, so we want to think about how we can use these principles to guide our decisions about where AI belongs and doesn't belong in our courses. Okay. So um, the first one is really going to focus on um, the, the academic integrity of, uh, piece here. Uh, the next two are going to be focused a little bit more on the kind of things that we can do with AI. And I'll show kind of alternatives for, you know, AI versus non-AI kinds of activities. Um, and then hopefully I'll fin with, finish with like a little, um, final little sort of concluding note about how I can, our mindset going forward with Gen, Gen AI. Okay, so here's our first principle. The purpose and practices of our policies in relation to AI tools must be clarified for students. And I think this se second sentence is really important because there, there might be contexts for all of us in which we can recognize that actually Gen AI use by the student will shut down future growth. And that's okay. <laughs> we should be willing to understand that for ourselves first, explain it to the students and be willing to say, we can't use it in this context. You can't use it in this context because I'm helping you develop a skill, um, some kind of cognitive skill, some quality, some characteristic that will help you in the future. And so that's the first part here to think about that transparency piece. How do we make, how do we commute? First of all, again, talk to each other about this, recognize that what's happening in our own courses, and then share that with the students and, and even find ways to kind of um, make sure that doesn't happen in our courses in terms of promoting academic integrity. Okay, so let's start um, by, I'm gonna give you a sort of a parallel case here. So we can think about that. Okay, so let's say I want uh, kind of an assignment or something I want students to do in my class. And I tell them, I you know we're not used, I don't want to use Gen AI for, Gen AI for this particular thing because I think it will, will you know, shut that off that future growth for you. Um, and I want to be able to sort of give policy, um, create policies and be transparent about them with the students. So does that, you know, can we still do that? Some people are saying now, no, we should just sort of say Gen AI is, is going to be there. Um, and we, you know, we have to sort of accept that it's going to be there. I'm going I'm to suggest here, actually, if we are believe that's something that students will do, um, we shouldn't be using Gen, Gen AI for, we can still do that. But I think it's, we have to take a particular approach to this, this sort of transparent approach. So I'm gonna give you a parallel case. So this is not a case, uh, the study came out last year, it was not so much about AI, but to sort of students um, using um, code, um, using um, who are creating code in a class um, in a computer science course. And the instructors did want, did want the students in this particular case to not be using other tools and they wanted the students to create their own code. And so what they did, this, this instructor has tested some strategies to help students adhere to those policies and not use uh, um, engage in academic dishonesty in these particular assignments. So here's what they did. They called these these low effort academic uh, low effort strategies to reduce academic dishonesty. You can see them in the in the, in the table there. For example, uh, integrity talk. So you can see the pre intervention. So this this is um, what they used to do. And then what the intervention did uh, over course of actually over the course of several semesters, how they how they moved from that prevent intervention to the intervention uh, approach. So for example, first day of the semester or first week of the semester, they they gave more time to explaining why they had these policies. They gave a quiz um, in in the third week about the the policies. They um, allowed retraction. In other words, if students um, submitted something thought um, better of it afterwards that they had maybe used uh, things they shouldn't have, they were allowed to retract it and resubmit it. They had reminders about the, uh, you know, about a third, a third of the way into the semester. They showed, this is really important. They showed students the tools they could use and really were very deliberate about this to say, here's the ways that you can do this work if you need help without re resorting to things that we asked you not to do. And then finally, multiple uh, opportunities for students to get help in the syllabus, um, pointers throughout the semester, and frequent reminders about you know, the tools themselves, um, the ways that students could get help when they need it. 
Okay, so this is a case in which this instructor said, here's a policy. We don't want to use this to use these other kinds of resources. Here's why, and here's multiple ways we're going to remind you about this and show you the tools that will help you to, to do the work on your own. Okay, so I'm going to show you what the results that they um, uh, uh, um, that they show in the uh, the show in the in the paper. What you see on the orange and red bars are the ones that were pre-intervention, right? The, the, these are the the uh, what they call the high. So the way they measured the uh, academic integrity here, stuff here was about um, uh, high similarity reports. In other words, if the students' uh, submissions were too similar to um, you know stuff in the uh, existing literature, or that the students in, in like a large group had this high similarity reports. Um, so that, that was an indication that was probably cheating. So you can see here, and then in the, uh, in the green and blue is the post-intervention. And so what do you see here? You see a significant reduction from uh, uh, academic dishonesty um, as a result of these interventions, these low effort interventions. So this tells me um, we can sort of say there are certain tools that I don't want you to use because they're going to sort of shut off that future growth. And but then we have to be really deliberate and transparent about what we're doing and why. And so and we can do that in these kinds of low effort strategies here. So here's some ways that I think they did that. First exposure, very strong um, you know, explanations of why the policies were in place. Ongoing engagement, the, the little quizzes, the, the sort of check-ins, the reminders about the policies. Active learning. So the students actually had to sort of process and think about and remember the policies. And this is really important too. They listened. They listened to what the students were, were, were saying about, um, you know, so the, the, the uh, you know, where, where do they need help? Um, and this, these, that's how they develop these policies over time. Where do the students need help? How could they um, explain better what were, they were doing and why? So these are really, again, low effort strategies that were done throughout the semester to help students understand how to get help, the reasons for the policies, and how to sort of, um, su be successful in the class. Now, a couple of just quick little things about what would, what would support this kind of work. So first of all, um, you know, transparency in the, in the assignment design is a really important thing. And there's a whole framework to do this um, called the TILT framework. The TILT framework um, makes sure that we are very clear when we give students assignments to show these three things. What's the purpose of this uh, assignment that I'm asking students you, I'm asking you to complete? Um, here's what's going to help the skills that's going to help you practice. Here's what you're going to get, what knowledge you're going to gain from this experience. Why does it matter for your long-term future? Future, and that's explained in the assignment itself. The task itself, what are you actually going to be doing? Here's the resources that are going to help you, and here's the criteria for success. Here's how I'll be evaluating this work, um, and here's some examples of what a successful um, a model of this work looks like. So here's the in the tilt framework. There's a, a whole web page for the for the tilt um, this kind of tilt uh, process. I'm gonna give you an example from that tilt framework um, website. Here's a less transparent assignment uh, from a, a math professor, um, and this was her original assignment. <laughs> you know, simplify these expressions. That was it. That was the sort of instructions. Um, but she went through this sort of um, this. Uh, sort of workshop to your this process of making your assignments more transparent and came up with and then this was the sort of the result of that right so now you're seeing a lot of stuff in this um, assignment sheet but what was what it you know this assignment will help prepare you for experience um, you know simplifying expressions and then even further real life modeling problems are everywhere covid global temperatures right and so you know, the instructor is really giving some ideas about how to, why this is important, why you're doing it in this particular way. This kind of transparency is going forward in the place where we're using GI, Gen A or, or telling students they can't use Gen A. And this is really important. This kind of transparency has got to be built more and more to our teaching to open up the lines of dialogue between us and the students about when AI, Gen AI will be useful for them um, and when maybe when it won't be. So you can find more information about these uh, these kind of tilt uh, redesigns at tilthighered.com. I really recommend checking that site out. There's multiple examples in different disciplines. But one other one one other thing I want to recommend here in terms of transparency piece, um, that opening bit bit that they um, did in that first uh, the the assignment uh, 
the study I just showed you, where the instructors, you know, kind of shared with uh, the students the policies and and the reasons behind them. There's another way to think about that, which is not only I'm going to share my policies with students, the teacher, but also I want them to engage, to ask questions about it, and even maybe work with me to reshape it. And there's another approach to this that I really like from Remy Kellier's uh, annotated syllabus. And so um, this is a, a framework that um, Kellier has been developing for a long time. Uh, he's been writing about for a quite, quite a while now. And he used this at the beginning of the semester. He, he shows the students a syllabus. He calls it the annotated syllabus. And that syllabus is available online where students can look at it and make comments on it, ask questions about it ask clarifying questions, <clears throat> share opinions about policies and, and readings, um, you know, noting where things are confusing to them, um, you know, it, providing advice to each other um, and reflecting on how that policy is going to be, you know, useful to them or are there ways that it might be uh, evolve as a result of the annotation that the students put on the syllabus. I really like this idea, especially around AI policies. And so starting the semester with to say, here's the policies that I've developed. I'm going to put them in a place where we can talk about them together. I want you to raise questions about them. I want you to ask me about them because I maybe haven't thought about all the things that maybe you've experienced that you've already done with AI. Um, and so I want to I want to learn from you. And then eventually we'll, we'll we'll sort of you know fix this policy and then it allow us to go forward um, and to make sure that we are doing the things that we should be doing with AI and that we shouldn't be doing with AI. Okay, so um, one of the little resources I'll give to you here is from a colleague of mine, Alex, Alex Ambrose, and you've got a QR code there and as well as a um, a, uh, a link. Um, and this is a, a document that was created by Alex to uh, because he's uh, really um, you know has done a lot of work on AI policy. Um, he does a great job here of showing um, you, what you see on the one side there is a, a acknowledgement AI acknowledgement policy that students can use in the place where they've been able to use AI or um, where they, you know, they, the policy kind of decide, um, explains, here's the kind of four options here with AI, depending upon the uh, assignment. And then if they do use it, make sure that they document and reflect upon it. So um, this is a good uh, resource to check out. Um, and Alex is a great person to, um, to follow and um, learn from about AI kind of policy stuff as well. Okay, so um, so that's transparency. So that's, that's our first part here. Second part, uh, the trans the uh, second principle here is about uh, variety. And variety for me, so we're hitting the first, for me, that the, the two key things about teaching and learning always are variety and transparency. Um, and so there, you know, I'm, I'm sort of bringing them into the uh, these, this, our gen AI discussion, but they're things that for me have always been the key things about teaching. Variety, what we, variety vary what we're doing and be transparent about it. So uh, variety here, um, effective teaching has always, always created multiple learning pathways, right? So all learners will experience both challenges and achievements. So I'm gonna do things that will help students uh, have different pathways into the learning. I'm gonna make sure that some students are challenged uh, at, at, by these activities and others are gonna, are gonna feel, um, you know, like this is a smooth pathway for me. And I'm gonna keep varying the things I do to make sure that all students have a pathway that works for them. This, uh, this principle sort of aligns with both inclusive teaching and universal design for learning, right? So to create these multiple pathways into the things that we're doing and have students have multiple pathways to demonstrate their learning to us. So let's talk a little bit about this in terms of relationship, first of all, in a general way, but then also about AI. I really like the approach of um, uh, Tom Tobin and Kirsten, Kirsten Belling uh, and they call it the plus one approach. So this comes from UDL work. Um, they, they argue that universal design of learning, which can be sort of overwhelming to say, I've got to create a pathway for every single person in my class. Their argument is start by thinking about it like this. You've got the way you like to do it. Add one other way that students could do it. So if I'm going to assign uh, you know, a particular kind of assignment, right? This is the way that I would normally say that uh, I would assign it. Is there another way that students could also do that? And so this kind of plus one thinking to me is a way to great way to think about um, when we have a new technology available to us. Um, you know, I might do it in this particular way traditionally, but now is there a way I could use that technology to um, give students another way to think about it, right? One more way to help learners stay on task, give them more information, uh, one more way they could demonstrate their skills. 
So this is the kind of approach I'm going to take now as I think a little bit about the relationship between Gen AI and learning. So I'm going to give an example here. So, you know, we can think about the fact that a kind of skill that we, we want students to develop is how to organize their thoughts and present them to other people. Okay. So, you know, you can see I've got a whiteboard here, right? This is a way to organize your thoughts, right? So I've got, uh, you know, I'm trying to write a paper, create a presentation. Um, and so I can use a, a traditional tool for that. I'm going to go to my whiteboard. And I'm going to sort of write things down and move them, move them around and, um, you know, and, 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 and create and revise uh, until I get myself a line, an outline that will help me understand this is the organized way that I'm going to present my ideas to another person, my class, my teacher, um, the outside world. That's a sort of traditional way to do it. That's the way I actually like to do my, I like to do it. So if I have a, a writing project, I go to a whiteboard. Um, I find a classroom on campus or, a, a, you know, actually in Notre Dame, they have, they have blackboards. Um, and so I'll go in there and I'll start, you know, moving things around the, on the board till I get myself my, situated with my outline. And I've always kind of thought, well, this is the way to you kind know, of organize your thoughts. This is a good skill to practice. And this is a good skill that people from, that I should have in my brain. But I was kind of actually, to, I introduced you to Alex, Alex Ambrose um, previously. Alex and I have been talking about a Gen I, you know, for a long time now, since long time in terms of the last year or so. Um, but Alex sort of introduced me to the fact that, you know, he has a different way to organize his thoughts, which has really been uh, helped by Gen AI. So he does it, he does it in a different way. He, um, Gen AI can help with this process for him. In other words, he will take his, uh, he'll take, when he has a, like a, um, a project, we wants to sort of, you know, create an outline or organize his thoughts around, he'll take his uh, voice recorder, take a walk um, in this car, he'll sort of talk everything out come back, put the transcript into, into uh, ChatGPT, and ChatGPT will, will suggest an outline to him. He'll then look at that and then revise it according to what, um, you know, what se seems to him in terms of um, the best way to, to organize um, this particular topic. So it's still his thoughts, but he's using ChatGPT to kind of get um, get those thoughts in the, in the, the best order. Now, is there a real difference between you know this process and the process of the whiteboard? Maybe, but it was, it's worthwhile to try to think about what do, am I maybe offer both these pathways to my students? Maybe in one assignment the one and, and then another assignment the other, or to help students walk through these different pathways to see which one feels right to them, which one they found uh, most enjoyable, which one did they sort of learn best from. Um, the sort of whiteboard process or the chat GPT process, right? So the question that often comes up with, you know, use of chat GPT or Gen AI is, okay, should I, you know, allow chat GPT to just sort of write my outline for me for an essay? And the question there is to me is, okay, well, it depends. Is that replacing a skill that I want to have? Or is that supplementing a skill that I maybe already have had, but it's helping me go a little bit further um, with that particular skill? And so this is kind of gets the, the kind of the idea of variety here. Um, giving maybe an opportunity to think about both those things together might be worth considering. But I'm going to actually use a different example here now. So um, one thing we know about learning is um, the more the connections I have between the thing I'm trying to learn and other things out the, outside of the classroom. So like if I'm going to learn something in your classroom, um, I want to make sure that I can apply that thing to places outside of the classroom, right? So there's a lot of research about this. Um, this is a great study that came from, out from science uh, a decade ago, um, in which these researchers had students to uh, had students uh, respond to questions about the relationship between the science topics they were learning about and things in their lives. And you can see the results of this. Um, this was a really powerful um, sort of results in, uh, from this experiment, where the students had to do this work on a constant basis over the course of a year um, to have right respond to questions. Or engaged in activities which help them see connections between what they were doing in the in the classroom and science um, where they saw science outside of the classroom. Here are some examples of some of the questions they asked them to do. This is actually these were uh, like a, a middle middle school and high school students. Um, but you can see here this was an ongoing activity, and the ongo ongoing activity was designed to help them see okay how do I make connections between the things I do in this room and the things outside. Uh, this window, right, or outside of this 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 room. 
So write about it for a few in a few cents, draw a concept map, make a sketch, right? So those kinds of these regular activities um, produce these kinds of results. Okay, so let's take that as a principle. So you know, we know that this is helpful for people to do this. It taps into something we know about how people learn. So now we want to think about this and with the variety principle. Okay. So what could we do? What are the kinds of ways that we, we might sort of tap into this um, this this way of uh, encouraging and promoting learning? Okay, so here's one, here's the analog one. I've been doing this one for a very long time. Um, it requires nothing except, uh, you know, students, uh, their brains and either, a, you know, a piece of paper or um, a document. I ask students at the end of, the, of a class period to re respond to a, a connection question, just like this. Typically, I've done it actually in blue books, like the blue exam books. Um, students would have to have their blue books um, that I would give them at the beginning of the semester, and they would have to bring them to class every single day. And that the once a week, I would ask them to take those blue books out and write a, a response to a question in those blue books. And here's here's three examples of those questions. Tell me how something that we did in class today you observed in real life, outside of life, outside the classroom. Um, have you observed any of today's content in a, in a show, film, books, meme, anything, other cu cultural context? Or how have you seen how things that, um, how have you experienced this con thing that we talked about today in another course? It was always a really interesting question to ask students to do that. How do you connect the things that we talked about in British literature today to your political science courses or your environmental science courses or your anthropology courses, whatever it might be? Quite interesting to see how students respond to these kinds of questions. Okay, so that this, this activity, which was developed long before AI, um, is something that I was designed to kind of help students tap into this, this particular um, learning principle. So, that there's this, so here's a non-tech version. The next one I'm going to show is like a tech version, but not AI quite yet. Christina Moore um, has a great book on use of smartphones in learning. And she is, gives a different example of what this might look like with use of images and photographs. And so she, um, this example, uh, this assignment would have students take their phones, um, go out into the, into the wild, whatever that wild means. It doesn't necessarily mean wild nature, but like, you know, in a city, whatever, wherever it might be, and take an image, uh, take a picture, and then upload that image and write a description, uh, a caption, uh, like a, a one paragraph caption of what they saw in that that image or that that thing. And how does that relate to the course content? So I love this as a creative way to use the techn technology to go a little further into this, right? So when the students are sitting in the classroom, just tapping into their brains, that's one way to do it. Here's another way to do it, um, using a technology that many people have in their pockets all the time, using your phones. But now we can go take a little further a step, a final step further. Many of you might know about the work of Ethan Mollock, who writes about the, the one useful things um, uh, substack. And he argues that actually Gen AI is actually quite good at this too. Um, and that Gen AI could actually could provide models for how people can sort of make connections between things in the classroom and things outside of the classroom. And so um, as he explains here, um, LLMs, Gen AI stuff, is, um, they're, they can make uh, unexpected connections between the things, different things in general, but also we can use that to um, take care, again, this same idea here. Something I learned in class, make a, a new connection to it. You know, I'm gonna, we did this thing today, make a connection to it, to ballet, <laughs> or, you know, um, whatever it might, you know, lawn care, <laughs> whatever whatever you wanna think about, right? Jen, I may be able to sort of generate some of those connections. And so, Again, maybe I want to show students how that how, how that works, work through that process with them, analyze the results, and then say, okay, now you've done it with Gen AI. Now let's go back and try it ourselves again. So you can see here that the notion here of variety is I'm giving Gen AI is one other way for me to do something that's important. I can do it in a blue book. I can do it with my smartphone. I can do it with ChatGPT, right? So that's the variety principle here in action. And I think it's worthwhile thinking about the things that you ask students to do, not only in the classroom, but your assignments. What would it look like to sort of take that kind of um, movement across the different uh, kind of different ways to engage with students and, and learning, um, looking at all those kinds of different ways. Okay, last one, very quickly, reflection. So we, we like Gen AI because it's fast. Right, that's that's the good thing about it. It's very fast and efficient, um, economic, um, and so that's that's on the one hand that's good. We like that, but of course we also know 
that deeper learning requires time, right? That's why, you know, um, the, the longer time, more time we spend with a, an issue, you know, it, it was, we, the, the more that we think about it, the more we're able to sort of really engage further and further and really get in, in our long-term memory, have an impact upon us. Um, so, you know, we know this is a you know, basic thing about how learning works. And the th question that we have then is AI, because it's so fast, it, is it sometimes so fast that it might again rob students of that future growth because they're not really having being challenged to go slow down, to reflect. And I think actually when we use AI, maybe we say, okay, yes, in this case, AI is the right tool. And it's the way, because I know because actually this students will be using Gen AI in the future careers in my area. And so this is the right tool. Even in those cases, it might be, it might be beneficial to slow down sometimes and stop and you and reflect on the process to understand what's happening between the, you know, the steps of Gen AI, which are happening so quickly. So this is actually quite an interesting, a uh, new study came out from Stanford uh, at the end of the last year, right? That, you know, they sort of showed the fact that, you know, ChatGP responds well um, when it's sort of essentially not, I mean, slow down here is a little bit of a, not quite exactly what they did. They they they, they stopped to kind of reprompt it multiple times, and they they showed that every reprompt it was essentially kind of learning from um, from those reprompts and getting better over the course of the process. Right. So um, even AI was able to sort of look at it or yeah, it's kind of weird to talk about <laughs> use the language we normally use for thinking. But anyways, the fact that it kind of had to stop rework this the um, the, the prompts. Kind of it improved what they had the, the outputs, and the same thing is true for students, right? And we know that this is why I ask students to revise papers, right? Here's you do you guys do your first version, stop, reflect, do it again, and that's going to get better and better, right? So that the goal the goal that we want to think about here is how do we build that reflection process into our interactions with AI and the students' interactions with AI. So reflection. Um, you know, creates space and time for correction and adjusting. It promotes self-awareness about learning, but the, the can is really important there, that second side there. It can achieve these objectives, but they just, they all, they don't necessarily happen on their own. And so when we use Gen AI, it's really important to build that, the reflection into that sort of can space, right? And so assessment that we can have students doing with Gen AI can be enhanced with required reflective components. So just a couple of quick examples here. This is an example of, a, again, like an analog version of this. This is, comes from a, a book called Next Generation Genres um, um, by Jessica Early. Um, and she argues that, you know, a kind of interesting things that you can have students do with any work that they do is to create a, 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 the work itself and then a creator statement. She takes this model from uh, museums, right? You go to a museum, there's a, a work of a, a contemporary artist, and there might be an artist statement on the wall next to their work, right? That artist statement explains, here's what my, my materials are, here's my vision for this work, here's some, here's some I'm gonna show some examples how that vision occurs in these particular paintings you're seeing, right? So it's, it's an opportunity for the artist to step back and explain what they were doing, reflect and share it with the, the audience. And Early argues, we can do that with any kind of work, right? Um, a creative work, for example, have students, um, you know, kind of out of the box assignment, right? Students could do that work, but also create a statement about it, right? Even a traditional essay, a presentation, you can enhance that students doing that work with a kind of a creator statement about what they did. So for example, asking these kinds of questions, what did you find energizing creating this work? Where did you struggle? How did you respond to that challenge? How well did you achieve your vision in this particular work, right? This is something that can be sort of layered on to any assignment. Now, with that idea in mind, and with the kind of, again, like the plus one principle here, with the notion of reflection in mind, we can do the same thing with Gen AI work that students might be doing, right? AI developed work plus a learner statement. Why did you choose to use AI in this assignment? Explain the prompts that you use with an explanation you know, behind any further prompts you gave, for example, uh, we've seen the italics here. And what did you learn from this experience? So I think that we have to, the challenge that we have to face now is to think about how do I stop the process sometimes? 
And so students just don't go to Gen AI um, because it's quick, it's fast, it's efficient. How can I slow that down and promote that kind of reflection? So that explains this little, my final slide here. Um, you know, I think that sometimes we need to think about slow walking our work with Gen AI. Not because we, we shouldn't be using it, because we, you know, um, you know, there, there's sort of any particular, um, you know, problem or, you know, um, we shouldn't be banishing it from our work. But at the same time, we want to we want to slow it down. We want to promote that reflection, reflective process. And that can be um, something we can be done with these kind of statements here, these kind of uh, reflective statements about the students engagements with AI. OK, so those are the principles that we talked about. Um, transparency, variety, and reflection. Um, I'm going to leave, uh, leave this up, uh, slide paper just for a second here, and then um, at this point, encourage opportunities to chat and discuss and other questions that we have in, our, in, in the time that we have left. So Nancy, I'll took a, turn it back over to you if there's particular questions you want to raise. Thank you so much, Jim. Let me just start with saying that. Um, and if folks in the chat could join us in a, in a round of thank you to, to Dr. Lang. Um, we do have a number of questions in the in the chat. The first one that I saw is related to the tilt process. Um, so how do we balance the the more complete or the more uh, detailed assignment description with the need to also not write reams and reams and reams of instructions because students might just veer off and not not follow those. So how do we balance brevity with completeness maybe or with with uh, additional detail? Yeah, that's a hard one to answer in the abstract. Um, I mean, I think I would say I would tilt, tilt. <laughs> I would sort of lean toward um, like, you know, the, the purpose, right? The pur purpose of the assignment, the skills it's trying to develop. Um, you don't necessarily have to have like a checklist of the things that you have, students have to do um, to be successful. Um, I think it's more about the the purpose and the relevance, the, the long, the skills it's developing, um, I think you, you you definitely sort of um, in my discipline, for example, like in English, I can essentially use my assignment sheet to sort of give students an outline. You write an introduction, write three pair body paragraphs, you know, and I might want to do that at the beginning of the semester for the first assignment sheet. But maybe after I go over the course, you know, by the end of the semester, I shouldn't necessarily have to do that kind of work because I want students to have started developing those skills on their own. Right. So maybe one way to think about this is always, you know, mentioned the sort of the purpose and the relevance of it. Um, but then you can sort of sort of step back away from maybe those sort of more um, specific detailed things about how to um, complete the assignment as the semester goes on, because that's probably what we would normally be trying to be doing in any kind of uh, educational experience, helping students develop, gradually develop the skills to do it on their own instead of just sort of following the template, right? So maybe that's one way to think about it. Um, the, the assignment sheets may be a little of less um, uh, I don't know, detailed about the sort of the steps or the checklist um, as the semester goes on. Thank you. So another question. Um, if we are not allowing generative AI in either in an assignment or in parts of an assignment, how do we then grapple with or think about the potential use of generative AI in when students are performing assessments? Related to those assignments um, or that learning activity, so could you could you explore that tension a little bit? So um, the assignment and assessments, are you, I feel like the same. Is, we did you? Well, what, if sort of we're engaging students in a learning activity where they're activity. not allowed to use generative AI, and then we, we the potential of students to bring in generative AI in in a, a, an exam, for example, a take home exam or something like that. Yeah, I mean. Right. So in other words, you're doing something in the classroom that is not use Gen AI, and then it's possible to use Gen AI for the, the, the formal assessment. Is that the, the question there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I, again, I, the, 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 for me is that the low effort stuff is to think about, okay, continuing to sort of promote the reasons for these things. Um, I mean, people sort of have, keep asking the question of like, how do I make sure that students don't use Gen AI when they're not supposed to? I'm not sure that I mean we're, I, I feel like we're kind of beyond that past that beyond that point because there's you know sometimes just some of this, these things that we ask students to do in a more traditional ways, um, Gen AI can do them, <laughs> and so you can't just say um, you know um, you know just don't don't do it or expect not 
student that no students will will sort of take that that wrong route essentially. Um, but I think we can just be very deliberate and transparent about what students asking students to do that. The other way you can think about it is sometimes there's there's multiple ways to um, again think about the plus one thing here. So maybe I'm gonna have students write a traditional essay, traditional essay, and so okay that that Gen A can do that work. I'm gonna be very transparent about it. I'm gonna make the case for this is why you shouldn't do it. But I might also do something like an oral exam to make sure that. So again, I have like two different ways to assess that um, to make sure that there's I can sort of um, if students just do the the have Gen A write their paper, um, they won't be able to succeed on the other one, right? Because I, they didn't do the actual work for themselves, right? So I have to maybe think about again the plus one principle here might be what a, a way to address that when students are doing Gen AI stuff. There's another way that I can assess that their their knowledge. Um, in a different kind of context. So that might be another way to think about that. That's interesting to think about too, because in when we talk about assessment more broadly, we like the idea of multiple methods to really try right. to get at the phenomenon to understand right. you know, how well students are learning. And so so in the classroom level, it kind of example of multiple methods. Yeah, even you could think about the fact, not only an oral exam, but like an, a timed exam in the class, right? So that, I mean, that would also be sort of designed to kind of offset the possibility of like, a, again, the traditional essay, and then there's also an, an exam in the class. I mean, so there's and again, again, just I like, go back go to that go to back that go back to that principle, right? So that that, that plus one thing, um, the multiple methods. That's that's the way to think about how to address these kinds of issues. And again, you know, as, as someone who teaches writing and believes in the power of writing to help people think and and improve their their thinking and stuff like that, I'm not gonna let it go. I'm not gonna let go of students writing in traditional ways because I think those things are important and they help people. And they help people learn and grow. Um, but I might need to supplement those in maybe more than I used to in the past. And I do think we have several sessions that are focused on writing that are in writing disciplines and then beyond writing disciplines, like writing focused disciplines. Um, and I think I'm also thinking of one of our future sessions where someone talks about like we articulate the particular roles that Gen and AI can play so that it and, and say, you know, it can play this role, but it shouldn't play this role as you right. described. It can be a tutor to help you with right. getting you started, but it's not going to do the whole thing. So, and and I think it comes back to that idea of, of being being transparent and talking with our students about our expectations. Yeah. We are at time. We will capture all the questions that are being posed in the chat. Um, so, you know, we may not be able to have, if, we, if there are sort of things we can provide immediate answers to, like resources, we can follow up in our emails to all of you with those sort of responses. Um, if there are larger sort of philosophical questions or teaching challenges, debates, these can inform our future programming. So while it, it, it might not be a chance to have Dr. Lang address those this morning, um, I do. your questions are valuable and they will help us to inform um, future directions we take in talking around generative AI. Um, and there may be opportunities that we can, again, to pair folks and to, and to, and to reconvene and, and, and grapple with some of those questions that you have. So thank you, Dr. Lang, so much.